Sometimes maybe not the way we'd like for him to, but certainly in the way that's best. It is a joy to see each of you here this evening, and we are thankful for the opportunity to be together and appreciate time in the house of the Lord. I hope that you are praying for uh, the back-to-school bash on Saturday, if everything goes according to plan. Maybe the weather's going to cooperate, and we'll be able to uh, get our uh, opportunity to minister in the community pulled off without too much difficulty. So I hope that you'll remember that in your prayers and pray that the Lord will uh, just give us a good day and a great opportunity to be a blessing to those in our community. Also, uh, don't forget that Sunday week we're going to have another high Attendance Sunday, invite false folk to church and have an evangelist and evangelistic day in preparation for our baptism on September the 1st. So I hope that you'll keep these things in mind and pray much about them. And so uh, those are some things that I wanted to mention. And we appreciate all that uh, everybody did Sunday to celebrate with us i'm enjoying the last few hours of my somebody gave me a kind card said in horse years you're glue <laughs> so uh i guess it's a shame to let me know who said it they just said your friends and over the hill club so i've got a few hours before that takes place uh, if you want to get real technical i don't have to worry about till about this time tomorrow less 30 or 40 minutes my mother says I came at 6.30 in the evening on a hot August day, and she ought to know, uh, but uh, I guess tomorrow's the official day, and uh, I guess I'm glue, and one of the stickers said Interstate 2 Old, and I don't know what all, but uh, there's been a lot of 
no fun with it, but I'm thankful the Lord's let us live and see another opportunity uh, to celebrate another year that he's blessed us with. And so uh, we are grateful for all that's been done and appreciate all your kindness. Tonight we're going back to Romans 13. We're going to read verses 12, 13, and 14 and go as far as we can this evening and try to finish the chapter as quickly as possible. Uh, and we'll, we've got three more chapters in the book of Romans and then we'll uh, conclude that uh, book and we'll seek the Lord about where we go next and what we explore as our next opportunity for Bible study. But tonight we want to look at these verses and let the Lord speak to us through his word. So if you're able and can stand with us in reverence to reading the word of the Lord, we'll read the scripture together. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word to see him. I ask Pastor Tony if he would ask God to help us for a few moments as we try to expound these verses, please, sir. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you again so much for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, for sending your son to be the sinless, perfect lamb of God to take away the sins of the whole world. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather and study your word, Lord. Your word is the lamp to our feet, the movement of God of our lives. to encourage the believers to realize the time and the state of affairs that uh, the church is in. And certainly we can relate to these things being said. And there's a lot being talked about in our world today. And uh, with all that's went on in recent days with all the people killed in the two shootings and of course there's a lot of pressure to legislate this and regulate that and control the other but the, the root of the matter the crux of the problem is that we're living in a society that loves darkness rather than light and that's how we've come to where we are the value of human life has been so demoralized that people think nothing of taking another life. I was looking at the news a little bit before we left for church more or less to see the weather and uh, saw a, where a fellow had been arrested and I'm not in favor of animal cruelty for in any stretch of the imagination but he had uh, by himself declawed his cat and I'm sure that was painful. And they said that the cat, had, the cat had consumed some of his methamphetamine. And so whether he was on that when he declawed his cat or not, I don't know. But they were talking about how many charges he would have for animal cruelty. Now, as I said, I'm not for being mean to animals. I, 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 I'm not advocating that. But it's a sad time when people will get more enraged over a cat than they will human life. And that's where we've come to. And people think that this is silly, but it's really, again, the crux of the matter. When we've come to the place in a nation that we have legislated legalizing death in the womb or other places, that's how we get to where we are when life is of no value. Now, I'm going to give you a, 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 something to think about right here. This is a true story. I'm not going to use names, and it happened recently. If you come ask me, I'm not going to tell you who it is. But I know it to be a fact because 
I talk to the person directly and their caregiver. There is an individual whom if I would name all of you probably would know who has been sick for a while and has to take a lot of medication. Was made an appointment in Asheville to see a doctor. And that doctor tried to convince this individual to let him place him in the solar center and take all their medication away and looked right at him and said, in three days, you'll be dead. And the argument was, the medicine's not doing you any good. Well, my question was, if it ain't, why ain't they already dead? That's where we've come to because the real truth of the matter was, now thankfully some other physicians got behind it and got it stopped and filed some paperwork and thank the Lord for all that. But the individual whom said they were a physician, whom I thought the Hippocratic Oath was still part of what they had to take when they were licensed to practice medicine, and that was to preserve life at all costs, had decided that this individual had nothing to contribute, and it was costing more to keep them alive than they were worth. Now, that's sad. That's not in a third world country. That's right here in this community with a physician in Asheville that tried to pull that. And the, the caregiver called me and said, how do you feel about this? I said, I don't like it a bit in the world. I think it's terrible. People are trying to play God and decide who gets to live and who don't. Now, how did we get there? Because we're living in a state of darkness. And Paul talked about this. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Paul is simply saying it's time to get rid of these works of darkness and let a light shine. The works of darkness are the works which men do under cover of darkness and they want to keep secret. Obviously, there are sins that men want to keep secret that they know are unacceptable, that they know could cause hurt, of which they ought to be ashamed, of which men fear the results, and of which men know would do great damage. The only problem is, is it's not so much in darkness anymore what used to be done in the closet and in the, and in the back room now walks down Main Street in front of us. And why is that so? John chapter 3 verses 19 and 20 tells us, and this is the common uh, condemnation, that light has come to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. In other words, Paul is saying to these individuals, it's time that somebody turn the light on and let people see and understand that there is a terrible situation in our world today. And we are living in a time when it's more critical than it's ever been for the people of God to let their light shine because there is so much darkness all around us. People want to blame inanimate objects for what happens. And I, I, I realize you've probably heard a lot of hype in the news in the last few days about gun control and all of that. And, and I said this Sunday, and I'm, I'm just being honest, a gun by itself has never harmed anybody. It has to have somebody to act upon it. If you read your Bible, God didn't blame the stone uh, for killing Abel. He blamed Cain because Cain used the rock to kill his brother. It's that simple. And when you think about, if you think in those terms, I saw something this week and actually shared it. Uh, there's a little boy in a classroom said his liberal teacher said Gun, guns cause death. And he said, well, if that's the case, my pencil caused my bad grades. That's pretty logical thinking if you buy into that. But the problem, it doesn't have to do with guns. It doesn't have to do with cars. It, it doesn't have to do with any of those things. It has to do with the fact that people that are supposed to be letting their light shine have become ashamed and embarrassed and afraid of what somebody might think. And so rather than being salt and light, we have just pulled ourselves back and said, well, there's nothing I can do. Let me ask you a question. Has it ever occurred to you what it's going to be like for our grandchildren if things go the next 20 years like they have the last 20? I shudder to think what they'll face and what they'll have to endure. And so we as the people of God need to do all we can to let our light shine. Paul said in Ephesians 5 verses 11 and 12, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You see, in Paul's day, there, there were things you didn't talk about. Nowadays, people talk about everything. And don't think anything about it. 
And it amazes me how many people want to share the worst of the worst that they can think of for all the world to know about. I'm going to make a statement right here, and you can say, well, you've got some nerve. You've got a social media page. I do, but let me say this. Everybody that's on there that makes it look like that every day in their life is 100% sunshine and roses, and they've got a perfect life, and they don't have any trouble, that's a lie. And then those that want to get on there and sling mud at everybody they're mad at and talk about them and run them down, and then two lines down want to post a Bible verse, they're a hypocrite. And you can tell them I said so, because I'd tell them if it's standing right here. That's the trouble in the world today, is people want to be accepted, and they'll say whatever they have to say. they go along with whatever crowd they'll have to go along with, just so they'll have a following. Listen, I'm not, I, the thing about it is, I, somebody said, well, I've got 989 friends on Facebook. How many of them would show up if your house burned down? How many of them would be there if your husband or wife or son or daughter was dying in an ICU room? You see, the trouble of it is we're so focused on trying to be popular and accepted that we have forgotten that our very Savior was not popular, He was not accepted, He was rejected, He was ridiculed and talked about everywhere He went, and yet He fulfilled the will of His Father. And you and I should be concerned about doing the same thing. It, it, we're, we're in a serious state of affairs when people have better things to do than go to the house of God or read their Bible or, or pray or, or teach their children the things of God. And yet that's where we have come to in our society. We have allowed the secular world to rear our children. And instead of teaching them the things of God, they have learned the ways of the world and the ways that the, of what society says is acceptable. But just because society accepts it does not mean that God said it was okay. Further on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul said, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. What about Genesis 3, 8? They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Job 24, 16, In the dark they dig through houses which they had marked for themselves in the daytime, they know not the light. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. I've never seen the beat in my life of people that are sorry, but they never change. If a person's really sorry, if they've really repented, then they have turned and went the other way and walked away from that that brought them to that place of sorrow. I've said often many folks are only sorry because they got caught, because somebody found out, and it makes them or their family look bad. If they could have kept it pulled under cover, they'd have never been sorry. But we live in a day and an hour when it seems that anything under heaven is acceptable, and people have no shame, and people have no regard for morality. They'll say anything, do anything, act any way, go any place, and yet they claim to know the Lord. I wonder, my friends, how many people that say they know God have ever really had a salvation experience because oftentimes their lives are so full of darkness there is no light to say that Christ dwells there. I don't care how dark a place is. You strike a match and it's bright. What's my point? If you and I are the people of God and we let our light shine Sooner or later, darkness has to go. I've shared this illustration before, but the greatest example I've ever seen of one little light was many, many years ago, I took Teresa and the girls, I think Jennifer and Alicia were like 8 and 10, and we went to an exhibition coal mine in Beckley, West Virginia, and they rode us back in a coal mine about three quarters of a mile on one of those buggies, like they hauled coal out on, except they'd re-rigged it and put seats where the coal trailer was. And we rode back in there uh, that far, and he stopped and talked about a few things. And he said, now, is anybody here afraid of the dark? Nobody said anything. And about that time, he reached up and pulled a disconnect. And you've never seen pitch black dark in your life to your three-quarters of a mile back in a mountain. And they ain't a crack no whore. And he turned the light. I mean, honestly, I've heard the old saying, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I pressed my hand to my nose and couldn't see my fingers. That's dark. 
I've never experienced darkness like that in any other place. But all of a sudden, I heard a scratch. And he'd struck one of them old whitehead matches and held it up while it was as good as a thousand watt bulb in there. We could see everybody and could see him. And then he lit a little old carbide lamp and held it up and fastened it on his helmet, illustrating what the miners used to have. And I thought, unto God, every time it got bigger, I said, the only reason it looks any bigger is because the oven got extinguished. When you're in total darkness, one little flicker is a great big light. What I'm trying to say to you and I is this. We have bought into the lie that we don't matter, that one can't make a difference so long that we've about given up. But I'm telling you, it's dark as a coal mine, and it's about time some of God's people I strike their match and shine and let people see that there is light in a dark place and there is hope for a lost and dying world. But the matches of God are going to have to shine sooner or later. And if we don't, it's just going to stay dark. How often do we have opportunities and squander them? Woe unto them that keep, uh, that seek deep to hide their counsel for the, from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? Who knoweth us? That's Isaiah 29 15. And the sad thing about it is, a lot of folks anymore don't care if everybody knows them, because they're going to do what they want to do. I've had this said to me, it's my life and I'm going to live it. Well, they forget the scripture says, uh, we've been bought with a price. And if we claim to know the Lord and he lives in our heart, then he owns us. And we ought to do what he said. And if he doesn't own us, then the scripture also says, then you're of your father the devil. You say, I don't like that. Well, take it up with God. He put it in the book. You're one or the other. There's no middle ground. All these people wanting to straddle the fence and run with this crowd a while, and then that crowd a while. When the day comes when judgment falls, God's going to put them on one side or the other. They'll be sheep or they'll be a goat, one or the other. And only the Lord has the authority to do that. And the only option you and I have is to make sure we know him. And if we do, quit being ashamed we do. We need to understand that Jesus told us these days would come. But he said, if you're ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, before my Father will I also be ashamed of you. It amazes me how many people want God to show up when their life is falling apart, but when everything's going good, they don't want nothing to do with him. And then they, what about this? They want to drink. They want to gamble. They want to cuss. They want to commit adultery and live together out of wedlock and claim to love God. I got news for you. The Bible says those things are wrong. And if a person's right with God, they cannot do that day in and day out. That's why our world's in the shape it's in. Because the church has failed to be the church. And the world sees very little, if any, difference in the church and the community anymore. We wonder why the church has lost its power. The God of the church hasn't lost its power, but the people of the church have lost their power with God. Because our vessels are so filthy and dirty. And we ourselves take part in the darkness. Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. My, what a sad time, but that's, where we are, people have wrapped themselves in the cloak of worldliness to the point that a lot of folks wouldn't know the Spirit of God if it run right over them. We've generalized God down to a little pocket token that we just carry around. You know, we used to make fun of Catholics for putting a statue of Mary on the dash of their car. A lot of folks that's supposed to know the Lord, he's no different to that and them. They maybe don't have a statue of Mary. But he's just something they carry around. And when an emergency comes, they jerk him out and say, Now, you fix this, and when you get it fixed, go back over there and hush. I don't want to bother with you. I read this morning where Charles Spurgeon said that it was good to start the day with the dew of the Word of God while the dew was still on the ground and commune with him. You read that too, did you? Ain't that a blessing? 
I mean, there's truth in that. If you'll start early, and, and of course he wrote in the day when there were nothing but farmers and all of that, and they had to wait till things dried before they could do much anyway. And so he said, seize the moment. If you have to do it by lamplight, spend that time. Saturate yourself with the Word of God and let the Lord direct your day. So often we fail to spend the most precious time. You say, well, preacher, I'm too busy. If you're too busy, you're too busy with the wrong thing. We make time for anything else we want to do. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to do the other. Well, how important is God to you, and how much do you want to be a vessel of service unto the Lord? How much does Jesus Christ's death on Calvary and heaven really mean to the average person sitting on the church pew? The way folk act, it surely means little. God is not some dime store toy that we can just throw around as we please. He's either God and Lord of all, or He's not Lord of anything. And He ought to have first place in our life. We all have room to improve. But if we'd start early communing with God and calling on the Lord and asking Him about the things in our life, praying for those around us, praying for our society, listen, there's not going to be a law that's going to change the situation. There's not going to be a governmental official that's going to change the situation. There's not going to be another amendment that's going to change the situation. The only thing that's going to change the situation in our world is when the light of God starts to shine again and people get under Holy Ghost conviction and get saved by the grace of God. Then and only then will we see a change in our society. You say, preacher... Isn't it too late for that? We're still here, aren't we? There's still room to let our light shine. But oftentimes, we fail. In Ezekiel chapter number 8, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. That's Ezekiel 8, 12. And people have the idea that God's not seeing them. And they have the idea that God has turned his head from what's happening. I read this morning, reading after another preacher, uh, one that I respect highly down in Alexander County, and he used the scripture where the people offered their children to Molech. And he gave the statistics again on abortion, and he talked about how many children were aborted annually, and he had a picture. And this, oh, it was so moving. And I, this blew my mind. I'd never seen it, and I know, I know it's new. But we, we, we were able to see Alec before he was ever born. I'm talking about see him. You know, people nowadays take a picture and then they pay somebody to kindly turn it that muddy brown to make it look old. Them old timey photos. You know what I'm talking about? Well, they did. I didn't know there was such a thing. They did a 4D, four dimensional imagery. And his little face looked like he had been in one of them old time photo shops. But he's just sucking his little thumb and we could tell exactly what he looked like and he wasn't even born yet. And then he was born. And you know what? He looked just like that. Do you know the difference in the 4D photograph and the the view I got of him the few hours after he was born? There wasn't none. The only difference was if somebody tried to kill him while he's still in his mama, you wouldn't have been able to hear him scream. Now think about that for a little bit. People say, well, they're not really alive till they're born. Baloney. I mean, I've watched videos of they play with their hands and they suck their thumbs and they reach for their feet and all the stuff that we ooh and all that when they're here before us, they're doing it before they ever get here because God made them a living soul. We've come to the place in our society that we've said, well, there's nothing I can do. How long has it been since we wept over the situation and prayed and begged God to make a difference in our community? 
It has to start somewhere, folks. And we, we're waiting on the, the big move of God to be here or there or over yonder. And we're waiting on the big preacher. And I love them. Don't misunderstand me. But we have the mentality that it has to be a Ralph Sexton or a C.T. Townsend or, or, or a Joe Arthur or somebody like that that brings revival. Listen, all those men that tell you they ain't got God in their briefcase. He, they can't take him here, there, and yonder. All they can do is proclaim the truth. And if a people of God want to experience God, they've got to clean out a place in their heart for him to dwell. Be willing to pay a price. Let a light shine. Be mocked and ridiculed if necessary. But let a light shine. I'm thankful. And I, I don't know if you know this or not, but you ought to be excited. We reached a milestone last evening in our visitation program. We have knocked on every door within a half a mile of this church. And as soon as uh, uh, we get to go back after the camp meeting. We're starting on the next half mile, reaching for one mile. And you say, well, preacher, what good's it done? Well, I hope it's done some. David and I were, went to a place yesterday, and and we we didn't realize where we'd went. We were looking for another address, and we ended up at a place where a lady's there on hospice a few days to live. And her daughter and son-in-law were there caring for them. They live in Marion, but they're staying up here through this time. And, and they were cooking their supper. And we said, we don't want to interrupt your supper. And we told them who we were and where we're from. The lady inside recognized my voice, called me by name, said, come in the house. And I remembered her from seeing her at another uh, member of the church here's home. And she said, mama's downstairs, said, go down and pray with her. Now, I'm not trying to put on airs, but you think that was an accident? God set that up. Run into another fellow, and he looked right at me and Brother David, and there were other teams out, and we said, do you, uh, we're out visiting for the church. Do you go? No, I don't go to church. I said, well, praise God, at least he's honest. And then he said, have you got any information? He said, I'm about to burn my squash. I said, yeah, right here's some information. He said, i got to go. I'm going to burn it down. And we said, we'll be back. One person said, I wish more folks would do this. Folks, I'm not trying to to build up or, or, or put anybody on a pedestal. But listen, people think we're doing something great. No, we're doing what the Bible said we're supposed to do. That's what's the problem in our churches in our area. People have failed just to do what God said. He's not asking us to do extra. He's just saying, do what I ask you to do, and I'll do the rest. And what I mean by him not asking for us to do extra is that he's not asking us to do something he's not already told us and showed us how to do. If we just do what he said, his spirit would take care of the rest. You have to understand, you and I have an obligation. As Paul said, to understand the nights far spent, the day is at hand. We need to cast off the works of darkness. And then he talks about the armor of light. And that's entirely different than the clothing of darkness. The picture that Paul uses here is of clothing oneself. Paul's saying you and I as believers are to strip off whatever dark sins and, and, and things of that nature we have and just turn them over to the Lord. Get rid of the, the dark works we've wrapped around ourselves and cast them away. And once we've stripped ourselves of those things, the question arises, well, then, if we've took that off, what are we to put on? Well, he puts on, what he puts on is a very striking contradiction to what he took off. Notice he said, listen to what he said. Cast off the works of darkness. Cast that garment off. But what are we to put on? We're not just exhorted to put on clothes of light. Notice the scripture. What does it say? It says armor of light. When we walk in the light, we're clothed with a heavy shield and protective armor of light, a shield and protection so full of splendor and glory and brilliance that it cannot be pen penetrated by the works of darkness. Well, then, what is the armor of light? It's the armor of righteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse number 7, I believe it is. 
by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. How are we going to have that? By walking in the word of truth, the power of God. I don't have any supernatural power, and you don't either. But the God I serve can move mountains. And if you and I just walk with that kind of faith and that kind of attitude and just believe that God's exactly what He said and He'll do exactly what He said He'd do, you and I would stand in amazement with our mouth agape watching God be God in our lives and the lives around us. But all things are proving but in all things approving ourselves as ministers of God by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, as I read to you. Listen, we need to understand that this is serious business. It is the armor of God. And then Ephesians chapter 6. You've probably heard this read before, but I, I want to read it to you and point out a couple things. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, and follow, and finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual weakness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. I withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, listen, having your lawns girt about with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. What's the first thing he said to do? Everybody thinks all oh, they need the helmet of salvation. Yeah, we do. Need the shield of faith? Yes, you do. Need the breastplate of righteousness? Yes, you do. Need my feet shod good? But what's the first thing Paul said? He said, have your loins girt about with the truth. Now, I'm not trying to be crude, but many times when those soldiers went into battle, they didn't have a lot of clothing, but they did have a loincloth, and they did have some protection there because if you get wounded in that area, male or female, you ain't going to live long. There's a lot of blood right there. And you know what God said to cover it with? The truth. The first thing you and I need to understand is we've got to walk in the truth of God. If Listen, if we're saved, that's, that's wonderful. But if we don't wrap ourselves in the truth of God, we don't have any power. If we're not wrapped in the truth of God, we don't understand the breastplate of righteousness. If we're not covered in the truth of God, we don't know what to do with the shield of faith. If we're not wrapped in the truth of God, we don't know how to use the sword of the Spirit. What's my point? We better be sure we understand the Word of God and what God says about how we ought to live and cover our most weak areas with God's truth. In other words, we must understand that we need the truth of God in our life. And where there is truth, there is light. And light and truth go together just like darkness and sin go together. And by the way, light kills darkness. If you don't believe it, go home and find the darkest closet you've got. And get in there and shut the door and then turn the light on. I challenge you to search around. You won't find the darkness laying in the corner rolled up in a ball waiting to grab you by the foot. When you turn the light on, the darkness is gone. By the way, did you know this? Light's the only thing that won't, you can't make shadow. You don't believe that? You go home, get you one of them stick matches and get you a big spotlight and hold the match up and look on the wall and you see the match stick. Then light the match and hold it back up. You still see the stick, but the light won't shadow. You can't shadow light. Light dispels darkness. Light with light will not create a shadow. But light and darkness make a shadow. What I'm trying to get us to understand, church, is we need to be letting our light shine. The children used to sing it. This little light of mine, and I wish they'd still sing it. One of my favorites, I know I'm 50 years old, but I love to sing. This little light of mine... I'm going to let it shine. 
this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. You and I ought to understand those children are on to something. We've just got old and sought in our ways, as my granddaddy used to say, and we ought to get over that and be like a child and say, I'm proud of Jesus. Listen, these little children, you can't shut them up. You let them come out of Sunday school and they've just studied David and Goliath. They'll tell everybody they see for two weeks. And you and I are afraid to say a prayer over our meal in public because it might offend somebody. We ought to let our light shine everywhere we go. Do our best to tell somebody there's a better way. Listen, you and I are clothed with a heavy shield and protective armor of light, a shield and protection so full of splendor and glory and brilliance that it can't be penetrated, as I said, by the works of darkness. But the armor of God is the belt of truth, the blessed plate of righteousness, the sandals of the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and the supernatural resource of the soldier is prayer. You know what Satan loves to do? He doesn't care if you go to church. There's a lot of lost people going to church. He doesn't really care if you read a devotional once in a while in the morning. But when you begin to pray, he wants to interrupt that. Because that's something he can't do nothing about. And you go to pray and get hooked up to God, you're going to get strength that he can't penetrate. But if he can keep you too busy, if he can occupy you here or there, if he can get you dabbling in this and that and the other and being guilty of, of sin in your own life where you're ashamed to pray, he can keep you weak. Prayer still works, folks. It's the only tool we've got that'll do any good. And oftentimes we leave it till last. But we need to be praying that God would cleanse our hands and purify our hearts and set us on fire for Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5 8, but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. You see, so many, many times we have the opportunity to let our light shine in a dark place but we're afraid of what somebody might think or say. So instead of being salt and light, we just go with the flow and then we get what we've got if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you've always got if you wait on somebody else to make a difference in your home in your community on your job in your school in your church chances are you'll be waiting a long time Remember Gideon? Remember where God found him? Remember what the angel said? Behold, thy mighty man of valor. He was hiding in the threshing floor. <laughs> Scared to death. But he was praying. And God sent reinforcements. I've been privileged to stand just a few yards from Gideon's spring. Where God whittled his army down to 300. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm being honest. I don't know if I'd had that kind of faith. But God wanted Gideon to understand that because of him and his prayer that he was going to do a mighty miracle. Folks, God's the same today as he was back then. And if you and I just believe now like those saints of old did, Listen, they didn't have anything to do but trust God. They didn't have a choice. They didn't have a fix-it button. They didn't have all the stuff that you and I have to figure a way to make it better. All they had to do was trust God. That's all they could do. So 
Sometimes I think it would do America well. And I listen, I enjoy convenience as much as you do. But sometimes I think it'd do us well, Brother Larry, if we had to go back like they lived during the Depression when they had to trust God to feed their babies, trust God to keep a roof over their head, trust God to keep their children well because there wasn't nobody to come and they didn't have money to pay the doctor. I'm not wishing hardship on anybody, but I'm just saying when we've come to the place that we've legislated God and regulated God and paid God out of everything we've got, we're in a sad shape. We need to understand we need him. Listen, he don't need me. He don't need you. He'll be God in the morning if every one of us go home and quit. But boy, we need him. If we'd ever get a hold of that. Another old song we don't sing much anymore. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp today. Oh, how we need him. What is the all? It's his spirit. Oh, how we need it. The lamppost is in the tabernacle wilderness. Symbolized the light. The oil symbolized the spirit. And they were to keep that burning. God, help us to desire the fire of God to burn within us. So bright. The folk would say, what is it? Keeps them going. How is it that they persevere? It is because of the Spirit of God that we can make a difference. I wonder tonight, are we interested in being light? Really interested in being light? Or we just soon blend in and not stick out? Because we're afraid what somebody might think. God help us to understand we need His truth. And this world needs to see some light. That's the only hope we've got. It's the only hope we got. Because without it, the world as you and I know is forever changed. And I don't want that. I want to see God move. I want my children and grandchildren to, to experience a move of God. But if they have to endure on till Jesus comes, they'll have something to hold to. God help us to let our light shine that they might see the way. We need some laborers that'll take the light and blaze a trail through the briar patch so when the tough gets around us and we've let an example go with our life that those following us would say well if they made it surely so can I but if we let our light go out what comes to those that follow close with this the primitive quartet's got a song they've sung for years it's entitled it's never gone out it talks about the flame of life it says the flame has flickered but the fire's never gone out though satan has tried many times to make me doubt and we've all been there god help us to say lord fan the flame Let us be light. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to desire to be a light in this dark world. That folk would see that there is hope and it comes through Christ. 
Lord, forgive our failures and help us to be who you'd have us to be. Help us to trust you when we don't see the way. I pray, Lord, you'll just light a fire in us that'll never be quenched. And a greater desire to see others come to know Jesus. Have your way tonight, dear Father, and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I appreciate you being here tonight. I hope that you've been challenged as have I to try to continue to be light. There are hard days and sometimes we get discouraged. It's easy to do. God help us to do what we can while we can because time is surely, surely running out. Why don't we do this tonight? Why don't we have the final prayer just around the altar together? Praying that God will let our Help us to let our lights shine in this dark world of sin. If you can, come join me. If you can't kneel, you can sit on these front rows. Let's just close together in prayer. Our Father, as we bow our head in your presence tonight, we come before you, Lord, realizing, Lord, that the first thing we must do is, Lord, confess before you that we are a sinful people. As Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he said, Lord, I'm undone. My lips are unclean, and I dwell among a people that, of unclean lips. God, may we confess our sin before you tonight and ask you, God, to help us to be willing to be as Isaiah was when the angel brought the coal with the tongs and touched it to his lips, uh, spiritually, Lord, cleansing him, purifying him. God, may we desire to be purified in ourselves that we would have a light that would shine so bright that folk would begin to see that there is hope in Jesus. Father, I pray you'll bless our endeavors here at the church to reach this community. And Father, I pray that our light will shine, that we will continue to make a difference in the lives of others. Father, I pray that you'll help us to work to achieve our goal of winning people to Jesus this year. God, thank you for the souls that have been saved. And Lord, we believe you for still yet others. And God, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll have your way. And do, Lord, what needs to be done in our lives. That we would be, Lord, salt and light in this world. That people would know that there is something to this man, Jesus. I pray, God, that you'd help us to realize there's power in his name. And that we'd never forget that you have commissioned us to go and share the gospel. Tell everybody we see about Jesus. Let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Father, I pray tonight that we'll go away stirred. Lord, desiring more of you and less of us, that you could use each of us to light some dark corner of this world that others might come to faith in Christ before it's too late. Help us on Saturday, Lord, if it be your will. Give us a good day to minister, win people to Jesus. Father, go with us. Lead God and direct us these days. And help us to do that that would honor you. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen.
we're all going to wear if you hadn't got your seer before you leave. 